so our uh, last speaker for the morning is Pavel Cerny. So Pavel is an assistant professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, his in <coughs> main interests there are in program synthesis <coughs> and format verification. And he's going to tell us about a little bit of work that he has done at uh, the intersection of doing program synthesis and network uh, and software-defined networking, in particular, how to update the state in an, in an SDN. So without further ado, I will. OK, thank you, Marco. Thank you for inviting me here. It's a great workshop. Um, so I'll, uh, this, what I'll present is a joint work with Jed McClark, who is my PhD student in, at Colorado, and with two colleagues for con from Cornell, Hossein Hojad and Nate Foster. Uh, so, OK. Um, uh, this is the view of SDN, so I'll, I won't go through too many details uh, at, at this point, right? So we have a controller that can uh, send commands to these switches, and uh, it can programmatically configure the network. And so, so to this end, there, there, there have been many research and industrial proposals uh, for, uh, for languages on, on how to do it. And one key problem that these languages have to do is to uh, one key problem that, the, that one needs to solve is the problem of network updates, right? And the problem is that you are in one configuration of a network, maybe this red one, where you forward things from H1 to H3, and you want to keep doing that, so to uh, keep forwarding packets from H1 to H3, but now go through the green path. So that's the update, going from the red path in this part of the network to the green path. Um, and so, uh, well, one needs to talk about what's happening during the time uh, you do the change, right? So the, in OpenFlow, you can send commands to individual switches. And now you want to do it in a way. Uh, you want to update the individual switches in a way that still gives you reasonable guarantees uh, for, for behavior of the network during the time you are updating. So one, uh, one specification that, that, that tells you what to do is uh, is called per packet consistency and was proposed by Mark Wright, Bodney Foster, and other people. And it's called uh, yeah per packet consistency and tells you that okay, no matter what you do during the update, you still want to maintain that every packet either goes through the red route or or the green route, right? E uh, even while you are changing the switches, changing the routing tables at switches. Okay, and so they have proposed a mechanism to implement this and it was called two-phase commit. Uh, so that, that worked great, but the, pr the problem was that it was expensive in terms of the memory required on the switches. It required sort of doubling the memory on the, on the critical switches on, on the path, which is not always possible. So what we were looking at here is to do two things. Uh, one is that, uh, okay, have an, a mechanism that is more efficient in terms of the memory consumption. And two is uh, so to make it so that the, um, that the specifications you, you want to have for these network updates are more customizable. So sometimes the, the per packet consistency is not implementable in an efficient way. So then we want to relax it in, in various ways. And so our proposal is to have uh, so-called order updates where we are, where we are not uh, sort of requiring more rules or anything like that. What we are, our space is sort of, we are playing in finding the right order of updating the switches. Okay, and so to, to simply see that the order actually matters. So let's, let us look at the example again. Let's have this, we are going from the red to the green and we want to maintain H1, H3 connectivity. So if you do it in the wrong way and you update A1, H1 now forwards through the green route. It receives still packets from H1, but now it sends them to C2, and then the packets are dropped because C2 has not yet been updated. Okay, and if you do a simple experiment on Mininet, you see that for a little bit, the packets are being dropped. Um, so our goal is to synthesize correct order update with respect to that uh, specification I'll talk about and okay an example of that is the is the per packet consistency but okay we can do more 
and our inputs to, this, to the synthesizer are is an initial configuration, the one like the red route where we were starting at, the final configuration, so this was the green route, then the specification we want to maintain during the update, and the output is the update sequence, like the sequence of switches, in, in the sequence in which you want to order, uh, update the switches. Right, okay, so this is what it does. And, um, okay, what are the challenges? So, so one challenge is, is, the, is that, I, as I have mentioned, you, it's not good to fix one property like per packet consistency and say, okay, it, it will be good in all cases because it might be too strong to enforce efficiently. Uh, so, for example, if you want to go here, this is slightly modified in exa the example, you want to go from red to blue, then what you can do Okay, what you can do is to first update A2 and then update A4. So these two you can you can update for free, right? Because because the, they don't receive packets. So these two in, in, in the set of examples that I'll have, those two A2 and A4 you can update for free at the beginning. And now suppose you still want to update per uh, to still enforce the per packet consistency. So the two switches that are remaining to update is T1 and C1. And either way, it's not going to work. If you update T1 first, then it's going to send packets here, and the, and the packet will go T1, A2, C1, and then it will be forwarded to A3, T3, and then to H3. Okay? Uh, so that's, uh, that's not good. It will not be per packet consistent. If you update C1 first, then it will go T1, A1, C1, and then on the blue route here, and, and come back to T3 but it will still be a combination of red and blue. Uh, so, so that no, or no, order, no update preserves per packet <laughs> consistency, but if we relax to just that we want to just maintain connectivity between H1 and H3, then either of these two orders that I have mentioned will do. So for example, if I update T1 first, then in this configuration we do maintain the connectivity And in the final one, we again maintain the connectivity between H1 and H3. Uh, but, but okay, we needed to specify what we want. Like, okay, we just, the important thing was to maintain H1, H3 connectivity, so we need a specification language that will enable us to, solve, to, to tell that. Um, the other uh, challenge, okay, the second challenge that we want to solve is that, uh, is, is that, w w as, as we update the switches one by one, we, we are running through many configurations of the network, we, uh, and we have to check that our property holds in each one of them. Uh, so so that, that is good, that, that's what we want to do. But there, there are simply too many of these configurations, and, and w so, so, but fortunately they are similar to each other, right? So what we want to do is to check them uh, check them incrementally, like you, you check something about the network, then you modify it slightly, and you don't want to recheck the whole network, but just do something locally. Okay, so, so let me go through an example, so that um, right now I want a similar, a similar thing where, I, where I'm going from H1 to H3, and now, but now I have a condition that I need to go all the time either through A2 or through A3. Like every, every packet has to pass through at least one of those, either through A2 or A3. Okay, so here we find that A2, H4, C1, um, the sequence does not work. So I, I update A2 for free as before, A4 for free. And now if I update C1, then I get this path, T1, A1, C1, A4, T3. And that does not go through either A2 or A3. Okay. If, if I try this one, uh, A2, A4, T1, C1, so I update A, uh, A2, A4 as before, then T1. Now I get this mixed path between, uh, between blue and red, but I still go through both of them actually, A2 and, and A3, so I'm fine. And then I go I update C1 and, um, and, and, and I, I end up with the blue path, right? So, so, so that, that, that is good. I, I went through many configurations, maybe check them incrementally, and then, um, 
and, th and then I have found this sequence of configurations where each single one of them works. Uh, so am I done, basically, or are there packets which will which will escape passing through either A2 or A3? So, so, so that's a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> right, so my order of updates was A2 and A4. These were disconnected before. And then I updated T1. So after I updated T1, we were in this situation. And then I, I went through this, I, I went to here. So what about A1? The next state? So, so, so A, A1, A1, right? So A1 got disconnected uh, here when I, when I, I was, I was sending packets to A1. It went like this, and now, uh, now I'm starting to send packets through through A2. Okay. So, so in this configuration, the packets went through A3. Um, so that was fine. In the new one, they will go through. Actually, both A2 and A3. So, is there anything with the timing like that you need to reason about? Yeah. Y yeah, okay. Uh, any, any other specific uh, guess? So, so, what I need to reason about is that is this thing. Uh, so, so that if w w about the packets that sort of interleave with the updates, uh, so so that was a very good point, Marco. Uh, so, so what happens is okay. In in my sequence, I update A two, then A four, and then there is a packet which this green dot that that start that that is moving through through this path, right? So that is good. The packet is moving, and I update T one. I have the T1 and start sending packets there, right? So I now things are becoming clearer, right? Because the packet is still moving, and I might, if I do things quickly, th things quickly, I might update C1. So the packet that was in flight here uh, will now go through the updated C1, and then actually it will take this this path, which was not possible in any in any configurations that I have I, I went through. Right, because it sort it sort of went around and it was it was there in the network while I updated two switches, and it went through, uh, through through actually the T1 the non updated version of T1 which sent it this way, but then the updated version of C1 which sent it this way. Okay, uh, okay, so, um, so so then. Um, so then, is, yeah. sorry, is the problem that you uh, you can survive a change kind of at any individual right. switch, but as you add more switches, then those right. changes that your the, the original processing consider. Right. So, so the problem that I'm trying to you know explain is this one that that as if 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 you go and you update switches by one by one. And you might think, you know, this, this, uh, this is what I'm trying to sort of explain, that you might think that, that oh, it's enough to check every configuration, every resulting configuration in, s in separation, right? That you update the switch, you go to mm -hmm. a new configuration, and you check that all packets in the config that configuration will be fine. You update the second switch, and you think, oh, right, again, the third configuration. But there, there, is, there, is, there are packets which will interleave with these updates in the wrong way, and they, they, they will be in there configuration which sort of never exists exists statically but you still get to their destination right the, so this one still get to their destination yes but my property was uh, in this example that they have to pass through either a2 or a3 so so, so that that they will not do so right. are you worried of information flow properties or or, or, or may, maybe there's a firewall installed in a2 and a3 and so those packets were never processed right so, so the example is this, uh, right? So to see it again, uh, right? So, uh, so, so this is the full example. I want to. I have this red route which passes through A3. I want to switch to blue route that goes from H1 to H3. That still passes through, uh, but that will now pass through uh, through A2. Uh, 
the blue would the blue blue one passes through it too. So so I update one switch. Okay, things are fine. It actually A two was disconnected, so there's nothing nothing to check. Now A now A four that was still disconnected and there's nothing to check. Now I update T one. Okay, so this is the update T one, and I check that this one from T one to C this 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 combination that is now in the solid lines that is uh, that is a good configuration because it passes through both a2 and a3 so according to my specification it's fine and then i update the last one and even this one is fine that's the resulting blue one and that is fine right but there was a pack so i so i updated i, I checked configurations one by one and then uh right uh, then but then there was this sort of mixed configuration that i never checked that it, it went like this then it, then it, it traversed this link very slowly so I managed to update the and the next switch and then it, it went through through this okay and so 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 that's that's one flavor of the distributed systems problem there and what what we can do uh, you know like a global uh, sort of brute force way to solve this problem would be would be to just wait between the updates and let let the network let the packets that are in the network or when i do an update to one switch uh flow out of the network and then update the next switch so so that that would be the brute force way and we have some optimizations that 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 uh, sort of let let us not wait between every two updates okay so, so these are the challenges and now the the al basic algorithmic approach is that okay nothing nothing too fancy adapt first search where where we try to, okay so this this is the this is the schematic of the network and we try to update switches one by one and we try all possible orders essentially um, but but we do some uh, many kinds of optimizations there both to improve the, the the synthesis process and to improve the quality of the synthesized solution uh, Right, so we start with all the switches being non-updated, and we are going to the place where all of them are updated. And as, as I said, we, we, we are passing through this similar configuration. So we do the incremental verification, where we check just the delta, essentially, between the configurations. And we use the counter examples to prune, prune the search space, and then we use some more optimizations to remove the weights I was talking about. Are you trying to synthesize the scheduling of where, uh, when to make e exactly yes, yes. Yeah. and is it always possible, or is it because of latency that there might be certain configurations that schedules that are impossible to synthesize? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, 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 so it's 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 not always possible, right? So we might fall back to the to the original solution for consistent update, which is to use this two-phase commit. Uh, uh, right, so 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 th so this is the algorithm. It's basically the depth first search. We are trying to update nodes one by one. That's this slide. Uh, we are we say that uh, we we have these counter examples. So if we if you already know that a, con uh, a configuration is wrong, then then we reject it immediately. Otherwise, we try try our model checking. Uh, uh, try try to verify that the new configuration is correct. If if it is, we can continue the depth first search. If not, uh, if if not, we uh, we add to our set of counterexamples. Like like the, the actually the reason the reason we we learn the reason why that configuration fa fails, and I think that counterexample let let us prune the search space quite radically. And then then the last step is to run the weight removal heuristic. Um, so that we don't have to wait between every two updates. So how do we check? How do we specify and check properties in net of network configurations? Uh, so so the first thing is how to specify them. So we have so we we uh, provide a specification language based on linear temporal logic. Uh, so uh, so the H one eight three connectivity would look something like that. So a few words about that, right? So linear temporal logic is a complicated thing which has quite some unintuitive corners but it actually is used for hardware verification 
And for that, people have many front-end languages that compile into this linear temporal logic. Um, and uh, so, 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 so we can leverage that and have sort of more user-friendly languages to face the users and then compile it back to this. Why linear temporal logic is good for us? So actually, let me, s let me go here. It's because we, we want to reason about, about properties of traces, of pack, uh, traces uh, in the network of like what the, uh, how the packet passes through the network where these nodes are switches and, and this, this gives the path of the packet. And so we can, we can take, say, things like this, right? So, so in, in this work, we are interested only on, on like the linear time uh, uh, properties of packets, like what, what, the, what the packets can visit on a, uh, on a single pass through the network. So we can say that, oh, eventually it reaches some port, or, or before it reaches some particular port, it has to, it has to traverse uh, some middle box, let's say. So this is this waypointing property. And there is also the service chaining property. Uh, OK, you don't have to worry about, about reading these formulas. What, what do the formulas talk about? Do they talk about uh, a packet? Do the they, so they, they say the packet, at this instant in time, uh -huh. has to have port S. And in some future states, yeah. So if if, it, if that is the case, then in some future case, case states, the port will be D. So is the packet the target of the formula or, or the network? I think this is the formula. So, so, so you know, th this is interpreted o over the network, right? So the formula you read it exactly correctly, and then I'm looking, I'm, I'm checking if that formula is true for all paths in the network. So the, the, it's, the network is a graph. I, I'm looking through all, on all paths through that graph, and I'm checking if what you said is true. Right? If, if, if I start at port S, then eventually on all such paths, I will be at port D. This is for any arbitrary packet that is involved? Th this, is, this is for any particular, yeah, this is for, for all, all types of packets. So, so what I so so this can of course be like like the atomic formulas the things things like this I can check uh, what what the port is and I can check I can match on any sort of fields in the packet header so that I can specify that for these type of packets if they start at this port they will traverse some middle box in the middle before exiting through this port. So presumably then you have a model of packets and how the field values influence their routing. Right, exactly. So, so, so the yeah, the net, the, the, the network has that, and and sort of, yeah. So, so our model, okay, more precisely of what what we are model checking, is is the is the graph where you have, where 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 nodes are switches and they they the path are given by, you know, the topology of the network and the routing tables in the switches. Mm -hmm. So they showed that some uh, problems are not solvable because there's no sequence. But it also be the third space is very large in some sense, like it's exponential in size of the network. Uh, so, so the the search space is is very large. Uh, yes. So, so, so for that, I have empirical data that sort of say that okay, we we can scale up to t thousands of nodes essentially. Does it also scale up to more, to more and more, say, um, requirements? So that uh, say you need to go through these certain nodes and. Uh, so, 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 so it does. We have tried sort of larger and larger formulas. So this, this, this one is actually like a recursively defined so that we can make it arbitrarily large. And I'll show you a graph about that, how it scales. I mean, but, but the problem is, is like computationally, computationally hard exponentially in the size of the formula, actually. So, so that, that one doesn't scale. I mean, it, it does scale surprisingly well, let me say, but, but, but that, that one is exponential. In terms of the graph, it's... Uh, uh, y y you know that complexity is linear, so then that we have a good chance to scale. Right. Do you make a, or maybe w what assumptions do you make about the behavior of say the switches or things like that? When I mean, can they buffer uh, changes or? Uh, so 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 here here we can allow anything, right? Because we are just inter interested in how how a single packet traverses the networks, right? Not about properties that. That would say that oh, if two different ingress ports send the packet, then will will the first one reach first or something like that, right? So we don't need to model time that precisely. We can just look at, at the network <coughs> really as, as just a graph with, without timing. 
Okay, so let me uh, tell you briefly ab about the technique, which is the incremental model checking. So, so here we leverage the fact to actually simplify the algorithm that, that correct networks don't have forwarding loops. So, so this is the only property that is sort of baked in that we, we say at the beginning there are no forwarding loops and, and what is baked in in our algorithm is that we check that at every step we do not create a forwarding loop. If we do, then that was a wrong update sequence and, and we move on to look, to look for another update sequence. And so as long as it does not, create a forwarding loop, then, then for each packet type, we have a, the, the, the structure is just a DAG, or a DAG-like structure, it's, DAG, it's not entirely a DAG because, because we model that, uh, that at the, uh, the, the way we model that the packet exits from the network is that we keep a self-loop here, sort of it stays at that last node, and that, that's just a technicality. But okay, so, so what I want to show you is how to do the update incrementally. So I haven't talked too much about LTL, but, uh, but, but the, the, the key point here is that, is that if, uh, is, is that if we are in this uh, DAG-like model, uh, we, can, we can check formulas like these by, by labeling the graph, uh, uh, by labeling the graph with sub formula. So if I'm interested that either eventually I'm at, I'm at the port A or I'm at the port B, then for each switch I can model, I, 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 can, I can label it by, by what, what sub formulas of, of, the, of, of, this, of, of that formula phi hold there, right? So, so maybe, maybe, maybe these, these, these bottom nodes are, are where the propositions A and B holds. So those are some propositions about ports, right? Those are some AA. I'm interested in ports of type A and ports of type B. So they, so those are the ports at the exit of the network that some, some things hold there. And then, oh, sorry. And then, I, and then I'm labeling each state by what, what formulas hold there. So for example, for example, here B holds, then eventually I can get to B that holds and, and this whole thing is true as well. And then, okay, I'm just giving you a flavor of it. Then I can propagate this information back to the to the ingress ports, essentially. Uh, and so, uh, but now the key part is that what what now now I do an update of a network, update of a single switch. So maybe it's a switch corresponding to this node, and then, um, and and then. Suddenly, this formula is not true, so so I'll never have that. Eventually, a I, if if I go here, the, the, here b holds and not a, so I, this f a is not true. So that I have to recompute, and then but then the formula at h is already true because that one can can reach a through here and b through here, so nothing nothing needs to change. And then even if this was not the the topmost node, the, the propagation can stop and, uh, and, and I can just label until things change. I do not have to relabel everything in the network. It's the incremental model checking part. <laughs> and uh, okay, so, so, so that, that was the algorithm, sort of this depth first search, simple one, uh, where, <coughs> where was the main contribution was, was this incremental model checking thing. And uh, and sort of other standard optimization like counterexample um, based synthesis. Okay, so so yeah, it, the questions are entirely are entirely correct. That like how how does it scale and how does this perform versus the other approaches? That's what we looked at. Uh, how how did we do it? So we looked at real world topologies. Uh, so. Um, so fat tree type of topologies, small world type of topologies as examples of how things might be done in the data center, and then topologies from the topology zoo collection. And, f and we looked at properties, you know, that from the literature and from talking to people, those are the things that would be interesting for data centers. So ca some kind of reachability properties, waypointing properties and service chaining properties. Those are the um, and yeah, 
are all properties treated the same, or is it possible that I don't I mean, mm -hmm. like uh, loop freedom, you might be able to temporarily uh, tolerate uh, loops. Okay. If you know maybe eventually the packet's going to get there, it just might I go see. around a few times, but later. But dropping packets would be somehow worse because you can't even you don't even want to temporarily drop packets. The opposite. Please say the opposite. <laughs> 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 Okay. Loops are always horrible. Dropping packets is fine. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, 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 is it possible to sort of rank uh, kind of one of the So we wouldn't allow, allow ranking for now, but 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 we have this. You, you can write in LTL whatever you want. So that can include. So so the the loop freedom is is, is an example where 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 that that one is baked in. So we we require loop freedom at all at all times. Uh, but but for, for for the for the other cases, pre the the purpose of having that specification language is to l let you write exactly what you want to hold during the update, like before you before you finally reach the final configuration in which you want to leave the network, you can just say, oh, I I don't mind dropping packets, right? Like that that one you can say by not mentioning it in your specification essentially. Um. So, so this one shows that uh, the the performance. Uh, so, so this is for the this this graph is for the small small world topologies. We scale it to uh, this number of switches. These are actually the number of switches that need that need to change in the new configuration. So the overall number of switches, I think, ten thousand out and out of which six hundred change while we are updating, and this is. This 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 particular thing shows the benefit of our our um, incremental approach. So so when we have our implementation, with it, it, after each change in the network, we recheck the whole network. It scales like this, so it's still um, fairly fast. But this is this is not necessarily faster with the incremental model checking. What are small world topologies? Small world topologies are are sort of randomly <coughs> generated topologies with the property that from every node to every host to every other you can get through at most three hops or something. It's generally the property that you can have log or log star and hops to get between any two nodes and all. Yeah, yeah so a nodes. small number of hops between any two nodes. So do they overlap with other topologies well, like fat you can uh, Yeah, so, so actually, uh, yeah, a fat tree, a fat tree provides you something like a small world topology as well because you, you know depending on how high the tree is basically but the goal of fed tree is, is sort of sort of similar right so we did experiments on all three I'll, I'll just show you the results on small world but the, the results on fed tree look look very similar so, so the real world instance of a small world topology would be a data center or a small uh, world? almost all real networks have a small world property by virtue of the fact that you're Humans build them, and right. humans tend to build networks that are um, well, that have the minimized number of hops, and yeah. you end up building these. So if you go look at like um, you know, a whole bunch of like how power law distributions give you small world graphs automatically. It turns out there's also work like there. There's a paper called Heuristically Optimal Topologies, which just shows that like in practice, if you look at the cost per port um, of networking hardware, that small world properties drop out of minimizing cost for a certain mm -hmm. bisection bandwidth properties, things like that. So it just, it just turns out it's a good assumption in practice for almost any network that is in the real world. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but for data centers, that's my question for the audience actually. So, so pr probably most of them are built using some version of FET3, or that, is that true or not true? Um, they're highly regular, so FET3 could be an instance, it could be a spine lift, so two I tiers see. instead of three tier FET3. Okay. But the advantage there is that it's highly regular, whereas uh -huh. the small world is more like is statistical right, right. Across the folded class inspired you could say almost all data center networks built in the last five years are folded class inspired so okay. they're either so they're not a fat tree they're not a spine leaf but they're they're, they're small okay. perturbations off of that okay and okay. synthetic and synthetic properties synthetic properties it, it just means that that we made them up sort of because there's no like so i come from the world of program analysis where we have like you know github and lots of source code where we where we can like t take that as the real world examples yeah. here it was much more difficult to 
you know, other than by reading other papers, it was difficult to, to see what kind of pr properties would be actually interested for which particular particular network, right? So we sort of say, oh, we think it's reachability and waypointing and maybe some other things. So graphs are done for all, for these three. In principle, you can specify anything in LTL. Um, yeah, so, so that's what we mean by synthetic, that we didn't actually get them from network operators. Okay, so so this th this is another comparison to a to a standard model checker. So if you want, if you would build a synthesis, this this type of synthesis using a standard model checker, that that one does scale poorly. This this is a, a also because okay, we sort of run run it in batch mode where after each update of a single switch, we recheck the whole network in a, in a, in a different process. And so that so there is lots of overhead, it scales poorly. Um, we also compared to NetPlumber, uh, which which is a uh, which is an incremental model checker uh, built for networks. Um, I, yeah, so, so 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 here the empirical comparison says that that our our our, our scale scaled like much better. Uh, so this one this graph is different from the from the talk and from the other graphs I have shown because here we. Uh, here we update uh, rules one. Uh, so I was talking about as if we can update switches one by one, which I think is true in OpenFlow. There are some these bundles of rules that let you update multiple rules at once. And NetPlumber supports only updating rules one by one. So so we we tried that as well to have a fair comparison. So this one shows the number of rules, not the number of switches. And this is this is how my how does our approach scale with with properties getting more and more complex and we see that as the property okay reachability is simple and scales well and as the properties get more more complex this is the service chaining where you have to traverse more and more specific middle boxes in the networks uh, to satisfy the property and the, the so the problem is that the formula gets larger uh, so um, so 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 it starts scaling uh, we s we start to see scaling problems. Uh, this is a quick question. Uh -huh. uh, with the service chain, is, do you have like a number for how many services would be in that chain? Or I, I, I think this was done for three, so three services. And the, f the, the formula size was, um, okay, I don't, yeah, there were probably around like, I think it generally, it, it, there, there's like nine sub formulas and it's really exponential in the terms of sub formulas. Uh, but but okay so here these this 1000 switches 1000 updating switches so 10000 switches 1000 of them are changing and you can still do it in 150 seconds so two and a half minutes so that still seems reasonable these are this is an interesting case w which are which are the examples designed to have no update so in a sense for our approach since it's doing that for such it's sometimes easy to find an update it does it really quickly um, the problem is to okay look through all the space mm -hmm. and see say that there is no update so here where here where all of our uh, here is where all of our search space pruning techniques like the counterexample based checking uh, show show up that even even if there is no update no possible update we can determine it quickly and then choose one of the fallbacks methods such as the two phase commit proposed earlier uh, so th this is this this is the related work. So m many people in this room know know it actually much better. So so we started with this consistent update paper by uh, Wright, Blood, Foster, and others. There's lots of tools uh, for for network verification. We compared again th against this one, uh, the NetPlumber, and then there there are tools for network updates uh, using uh, network updates si similar similar to our approach. The difference is that uh, they concentrate on one particular, on, on one or a set of particular properties. So let's say this one con concentrates on waypoint enforcement, just one property. So the, the, the property is baked in into, into their approach. There, there's no separate specification language. Uh, so sort of here the approach is, for, for Dionysus, the approach is sort of, uh, that, that, that starting from a property, they generate dependency graphs 
and then start from there, which actually is very similar to our approach. The problem here is that uh, the problem here is that there's no algorithm to, 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 to go from you know, a property to its dependency graph. So that's actually a hard problem, which y y you know, we, we get around it in, in, in some way, like by saying, okay, we specified in LTL and there are standard algorithms in LTL. Here, what's happening is that they start as a property, generate manually, say, okay, this is the dependency graph and I understand that that's how it, that's how it works. Um, and then, uh, okay, the, so so that's that's the biggest difference. But the dependency graph key seems to be the, a key data structure and some some work that explains how to get these network dependency graphs from general properties would be actually it seems to be a great target. Uh, uh, so okay, and and this is this is the conclusion of my talk. So so we we started with this as as DN update problem as a synthesis problem and developed an algorithm that through several new optimization new optimization gets to a gets to a reasonable performance on realistic uh, on examples of this realistic size. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so if there is any quick question, otherwise in the interest of time I would suggest that uh, the remaining question we take them during the last session of the day. Just one quick one. Uh, do any of those problems you talk about in flight packets disappear if you assume that all updates happen immediately at the same time? Actually, no, right? Because because uh, right, if, even if you can update all the switches at the same time, there, there would still be packets in the network. So they would see some of these switches not, not updated and some of them updated. And it's precisely that problem, right? The, the same problem. So yeah, but so I will complement that answer by also saying that there are some people that looked into this uh, problem area in the proposed time-based updates. So they argue that if you can get your network or the devices to be sufficiently fine-grained, time-synchronized, then you can pre-program them with all the updates and then say at this time in the future, please switch over to the new set of rules. So now you has you still have the problem and you need memory over it and you need to have a sufficiently accurate way to synchronize devices, but there has been some work in that area. Okay. So I if you're working with Tyrodic and stuff where you can actually dictate how you switch works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, the other thing is in practice, um, switches have a lot. The capability of, sort of switches are much better understood right now than they were when this work started. And so the idea of saving switch T space was mm -hmm. based on the idea that you're using TKMs and very fancy things to do it. And if you're instead using something more like, you know, uh, MPLS, where you're basically putting a label, the label space in switches is almost, is, is in practice infinite for, I mean, it's not actually, but like for reasonably sized networks, you can have like 256,000 entries, mm -hmm. which is, it buys you a factor of 256 versus what the original set of open pool hardware does. And then you can start doing really fancy things where you, you don't, you just install both paths simultaneously in the network because you don't care. I know that makes the problem less interesting, but it, it works. Right. And, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it works really well and it's fast and I can understand it. Um, which I would think that that's in practice what people tend to implement when they care about consistent updates right now. Um, and, 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 and sort of that, that's uh, uh, inter an interesting thing to ask would be how you extend this to um, your understanding of what, what switch capabilities actually are in terms of their forwarding tables, stuff, like their capabilities, which is like switches have, depending on the kind of rule you install, radically different amounts of rule space available to them, especially right. in modern switches, which would be interesting. Like, could you burn lots of rule space to make it easier in the common case and then fall back to this when you run out of space, things like that? Yeah, that makes sense. All right, let us thank Pavel again.